So I'm very pleased to pass the stage to Dr. Charlie Hindmarch for his talk, Reading the Book of Life. So I've been reading the same book for the last 20 years, and it's just starting to get interesting. Everybody in the room tonight has their own copy of this book, but your copies are ever so slightly different from each other. This book is partly a history book, and it's partly an instruction manual that makes you, you. I am, of course, talking about the book of life, the human genome. I got my copy of this book from my parents, and they also provided me an environment within which I could make the most of it. It was my father that first introduced me to science. He's a botanist, and from a very young age, I watched him completing his PhD, nose to the ground, bum in the air, identifying wild grass species in the fields of Hampshire, England, where I grew up. It was through conversations with him that I was first exposed to evolution and ecology while we chatted about the origin of the species. I wanted nothing more than to be a biologist. I wanted to make discoveries that might one day change the world. Discovery is the act of finding something new. And the thing about discovery is you don't always know what you're looking for until you've found it. Now, science increases our chances of making a discovery. And it does so because it builds new findings on previous findings. We literally stand on the shoulders of giants so that we may see further. I'd like to tell you about one of these giants. Next month marks the 200th birthday of an Augustinian monk named Gregor Mendel. Now, Gregor Mendel came from an extremely poor farming family, and he was the only son. And him and his family could barely afford his education. In fact, he actually left university at one point because he couldn't afford food. However, Mendel showed extraordinary aptitude for sciences, especially biology and mathematics. And his professors thought that maybe a life in the monastery might be a route to the education he could not himself afford. So what was Mendel's big discovery? How did Mendel change the world? Well, just like today, everyone then recognized that children get their traits from their mum and from their dad. The prevailing thought at the time, however, was that these traits were somehow a blended effect between the two parents. Now, Gregor Mendel was a botanist in the gardens of the monastery, and he didn't see this phenomenon in the plants and the flowers that he grew. Mendel was interested in pea plants. So he designed an experiment that allowed him to investigate this problem of inherited traits. And what he did is he took pea plants and he grew a population of pea plants that only had white flowers. And he grew another population that only had purple flowers. And he crossed these two populations together hoping to find out whether he saw a blended effect. And what he saw was that all the children had purple flowers, and there was no blending whatsoever. What was more interesting was that the grandchildren of this first cross had a predictable ratio, where one quarter of those flowers were white, three quarters of those flowers were purple, and there was no blended phenotype. So what was going on? Mendel made a huge discovery that day. Mendel worked out that some sort of invisible particles must be passed from generation to generation by both mum and dad. He also, because of the skipped generation, he actually established that some of these particles were more dominant than others. And these are the cornerstones of genetics that we understand today. But why did Mendel choose pea plants? Well, he's famous for saying, only do science with things with which you can make soup. 
I obviously failed to get the memo when I signed up for a PhD in neuroscience, unfortunately. But he must have really liked pea soup. And the reason why, he grew 29,000 pea plants. Now, unfortunately, Gregor Mendel died before anyone recognized his work. And even though we call him the father of genetics today, unfortunately, I think at the time, people just didn't understand. He was way ahead of his time. Even worse, after Mendel died, all of the records were destroyed, except one publication in a local journal that remained undiscovered for the next 30 years. In the century that followed, scientists around the world continued to work on this problem of inheritance. And of course, they worked out very quickly that these invisible particles that Mendel discovered were actually genes. Now, the collective term for genes is a genome. And a genome is made from a very special, a very special molecule, which is called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is like a language. And like any language, it's made up of an alphabet. And DNA has an alphabet with just four letters, A, C, T, and G. Thanks to the Human Genome Project in 2003, we now know that the human genome has three billion of these letters. And just to give you an idea of the scope, if I was to read out the human genome from the beginning to the end, one letter per second, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it would take me over 100 years to get to the end of the book. And I still wouldn't understand a word of it. But no one reads a book letter by letter. In our language, we use words to give context and meaning. And it's exactly the same with the genome. The genome has words, and we call those words genes. That's about 25,000 genes in the human genome. Now, I've just told you that one of these genes is responsible for flower color, one trait. You're probably thinking, hang on, let me do the math on this. 25,000, that's not enough genes to account for all the complexity and all the traits that you see in each other. And I'd like to remind you of just two things. Firstly, in the evocative storytelling by William Shakespeare, I need you to understand, he used about 25,000 unique words in his complete works, about the same as in your complete works. The second point is of the 37 trillion or so cells in your bodies right now, every single one of those cells is reading the genome, reading that book of life differently, depending on what kind of cell it is and what's going on with that cell at the time. So your DNA is actually a recipe book. And it's a recipe book for all the proteins that you will ever need to make. If a cell wants to make a protein of any description, what it will do is the DNA will send a message with the recipe just for that protein. And it will send that message to a special factory that lives in the cell. And this factory will receive the message and manufacture that protein according to that DNA specification. That message is very important to biologists. And the reason why is because generally, the more of the message there is, the more of the protein that's made. So we can really start understanding how cells and tissues and organs and people respond to stress and stimuli. We call that message mRNA or messenger RNA. And I, as a scientist, I can intercept that message. And I can use a very complicated sounding tool to do that, a test called a polymerase chain reaction. And everyone's thinking, wow, that sounds really sciencey. And I apologize, but you've all heard of this test by its acronym, a PCR test. Now, because we know the complete spelling of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that's responsible for COVID-19, scientists decide, designed a test that allowed them to identify a viral word from a sample. And if it identified that viral word, 
you are positive for COVID-19 and you should probably isolate to protect those around you. But understanding the book of life of the virus hasn't just been useful to us in terms of being able to identify who has the virus. You've probably all heard about a class of vaccines called the mRNA vaccines. And what these do, it's pretty sneaky really, they sneak a tiny message for a single protein of the virus into the cells. And then your factories, your protein factories, then go and build that one protein. And what it allows is for your human immune police force to be able to come along and use it as a wanted sign. So if you're ever exposed to the virus for real, your own body has a way of dealing with it. So understanding how to read books of life really has given us a distinct advantage in this pandemic, not just identifying who has the virus, but also protecting people from contracting it. Now, I'm not actually a COVID-19 researcher, though I am actually proud to say the last two years I've read the book of life of human cells exposed to this virus and I've identified genes and pathways that have changed at different point time points through the infection. I'm a neuroscientist and I'm interested in the mundane. I'm interested in how your body of healthy people manages everyday life. This is a process called homeostasis. And that word just means keeping things the same. The part of the brain that's responsible for homeostasis is called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is famously been cited as being responsible for the four Fs of biology. Feeding, fighting, fleeing, and reproduction. <laughs> I'm interested in the function of water balance and how the brain is able to cope with us being wet organisms in a dry environment. If you become dehydrated, your brain manufactures an individual protein. We call that protein a hormone. And the hormone I'm interested in is called vasopressin. So when you're dehydrated, vasopressin is released from your brain and it travels through your bloodstream and it goes to your kidneys where it promotes water reuptake, saving you water at just the time that you need water saving. I could do a PCR test because I know the 800 or so letters that, are, uh, that the vasopressin gene is spelt with. I could do that test, but there's no discovery there. That's been known for a really long time. So as a biologist, how do I make new discoveries? My three boys are in the audience tonight. And I'd like to take an opportunity to inspire them, much like my father inspired me. And I'm going to tell them a story that I think is going to help everyone here tonight understand the reasons why we might go looking more widely than the gene that we already knew. Like many people, we all really like the Marvel films in our family, right? 90 minutes of a superhero, just like vasopressin, saving the world. And when we're, when we're watching these films, we're in the cinema at the end, and we're waiting for that post-credit scene. You know the one. And while we're waiting, hundreds of names scroll past us. And these names are all of people who have jobs. Production, catering, makeup, scripting. And one day while watching these films, it occurred to me, that's exactly the way my research goes. I'm often not looking for the superhero. I'm looking for the cast and crew. It was the cast and crew in the Marvel films who were responsible for making sure that the superhero appears at the right time and reads the right lines from the script. And it's the same with biology. The superhero vasopressin needs a cast and crew to make sure that it appears at the right time, under the right circumstances, and reads the right line from the script. So how do I go about doing this? Well, I work in a really cool place called QCPU, and we've got the best toys. 
And one of the cool toys that we've got in my laboratory is a gene sequencer. And I've wanted one of these since Jurassic Park, honestly. <laughs> what this gene sequencer does is it takes all of the messages for all the proteins that could be made, and it chops them up into manageable fragments of about 200 letters long. There's about 30 million of these fragments per sample, but we'll come back to that in a moment. And then it reads each one of these fragments, A, C, G, T, letter by letter. And at the end of the experiment, I have what basically looks like a jigsaw puzzle. All of these fragments from all over the place, and it's my job to try and glue these back together. Now, everyone's done a jigsaw, right? You've, it's a lot easier if you have the box with a picture of what you're trying to look at in order to be able to build the pieces back together. And it's exactly the same with my work. I have to take all these fragments, and I have to use a reference. But fortunately, we've sequenced the genome of many, many organisms now. So if I have fragments from the human genome, I can glue them back together. And this will tell me which genes have been switched on in a particular sample. And more importantly, if I compare two samples, a healthy and a disease, a controlled and dehydrated, I can work out what the cast and the crew are saying in order to be able to ensure that our superheroes of biology do their job properly. In the past 20 years or so, reading the Book of Life has given greater and greater resolution. We've been able to look at organs, tissues, and single cells from just about any disease state that you'd ever want to look at, and brought new resolution and new discoveries to those. And saying that, you're probably thinking, Charlie, you focused all of your efforts on dehydration? The cure for dehydration is having a drink, man. <laughs> and that's a fair point. Let me tackle that right now. And it comes back to discovery. The same structures of the hypothalamus that are responsible for managing that water homeostasis are also responsible for regulating blood pressure. And the reason why is because when you're dehydrated, your blood volume changes, and it needs correction by increasing your blood pressure. When you're dehydrated, that's a stressful event. And these structures also manage the main stress response of the brain. And the reason why it's stressful is because it's an immediate call to action. Being dehydrated is a survival stress. It's a threat. I'm also interested in studying diseases like hypertension and chronic stress in these same structures using these very same tools. Because I believe that understanding the molecular ecology of normal physiology is closely coupled to understanding the molecular ecology of pathophysiology. Gregor Mendel really was a giant and justifies the title as father of genetics. But he can't possibly have understood that his work on the pea plant might have helped us face a pandemic a hundred years later, might have allowed biologists at Queens and around the world to identify biomarkers to allow the easier identification of diseases, or to identify targets that drugs can bind to, to help you. But then that's the thing about discovery, is you often don't know what you're looking for until you've found it. Thank you very much.